In this segment, we're going to be talking about the urinary system. So this is the urinary system for anatomy and physiology two. Okay, we will first start off talking about the functions of the urinary system. There are three major functions of the urinary system, excretion, uh, elimination, and homeostatic regulation. So first, excretion. What does excretion mean? It means the removal of organic waste from the body fluid, and mainly the, the blood. Okay, organic waste. These organic waste in the form of metabolic wastes. So there are three major metabolic wastes that need to be eliminated through the kidneys, and that is urea, creatinine, and uric acid. We will talk about uh, each of these a little bit. So first, urea. Uh, urea, oh, what do we know about that? It's mainly from the breakdown, um, it comes from the breakdown of um, amino acids. So when we're breaking down amino acids, we get urea. We cannot use urea, it's a, it's a waste product, and so it needs to be excreted um, by the kidneys, um, out of the blood by the kidneys. Um, Creatinine. Creatinine is another one. Um, creatinine is a byproduct of a metabolic process that it happens in the muscles. So we have creatine phosphate, and creatine phosphate is a molecule that's made inside of our muscle fibers. And what it does is it combines with uh, ADP and gives us some fast acting, some fast, um, it makes fast ATP. So it gives us some ATP to use inside the muscle fibers. That's well and great, but what's left over also is some this compound called creatinine. This creatinine makes its way to the blood and needs to be filtered out in the kidneys, and it's one of our metabolic wastes. Okay, a third one is uric acid. And uric acid comes from the breakdown and recycling of our nitrogenous bases. So think of our nucleic acids and those nitrogenous bases that you know um, that come from those nucleic acids. <clears throat> We're breaking down those nucleic acids and then we have some uric acid. That uric acid is in the blood and it needs to be filtered out in the kidneys. Now when we compare the um, when we compare urine to blood, urine is much more concentrated than blood. Um, okay, second uh, function is elimination. All that means is that it's the discharge of those wastes into the environment. Okay, on to the third function of uh, the urinary system, which is mainly the kidneys that we refer to, but it includes all of the urinary system. Uh, it's homeostatic regulation. So to define homeostatic regulation is the regulation of the volume and the solute concentrations of the blood, um, and mainly the blood plasma, right, that liquid portion of the blood. So um, there's many ways that, that the kidneys do this, and, and I have listed out some uh, examples for you. One way is with the ions in the blood. There are many ions uh, in our blood, different types of ions. We've discussed this before. Um, and just to give you some examples, calcium, sodium, potassium, all of those ions that you recognize, they all need to be at a certain level in the blood. They need to be at a certain level within limits in order for metabolic processes to occur. So if they drop too low or if they are go too high, our kidneys help to maintain those ion levels where they need to be um, in the blood, in the blood plasma. Um, another example is blood pH. So blood pH, we have a fairly narrow uh, limits on blood pH. It's uh, from 7.35 to 7.45. And um, it, it, our body needs to maintain that P blood pH within those limits so that chemical reactions can occur optimally. So how do the kidneys play a role here is they help to keep it within those limits. How do they do that? They will do it by excreting hydrogen ions and uh, conserving bicarbonate ions and bringing it back within those limits uh, and bringing the pH back within those limits so that 
um, the chemical reactions can still occur. A third example is blood volume. So blood volume just sim simply is uh, the amount, total amount of blood um, that's in our body, that's running through our blood vessels. So how does the kidneys regulate our blood volume? Well, let's think about this. Our kidneys are, are filtering out our blood, more specifically filtering what's in the blood plasma, the liquid portion of the blood. And the liquid portion of our blood, if we are uh, eliminating more of that liquid portion or conserving it, that's going to have an effect on our total blood volume. So think about the water portion of our blood. If we're, if we're getting rid of more water and it becomes part of the urine or more urine, then we're gonna decrease the total blood volume. Right? If we're gonna conserve that water, then it's gonna increase the amount of our total blood volume or maintain it. Okay, another example is blood pressure. So we, of course, we think of blood pressure as the, what is the organ that creates our blood pressure, and that is the heart. It's creating our blood pressure. Our blood vessels are, are helping to um, main, maintain our blood pressure and, and um, equal, I don't want to say equalize, but it helps to regulate our blood pressure. That's a better term. But the kidneys do it as well. So this is probably maybe a lesser known homeostatic function of the kidneys, and this might be a new one for you. So the kidneys will help to regulate our blood pressure, and it does this uh, by a hormone pathway. And that hormone pathway, we call it the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone path pathway. Um, and it's, it's hormone driven, um, and it helps to maintain our blood pressure. Ultimately, it will, it will work to increase our blood pressure uh, when this, this pathway is activated. <clears throat> okay, uh, another way is to maintain blood glucose levels. And you think, okay, well, the kidneys really? Are, are you sure? Because I know all about the pancreas. Right, the pancreas with the glucagon and the insulin, of course the pancreas, and the liver, the liver stores, uh, glu the, the liver stores and even makes glucose. So the pancreas and the liver is probably the first organs that you think of when you think of blood glucose level. Um, and that's correct. But also the, the kidneys. The kidneys play what role? Because lesser known little fact about the kidneys, is they have the ability to synthesize some glucose. So they do. Um, it, they can synthesize some glucose, release that glucose into the blood, and therefore increase the blood glucose levels. Okay, another function, or our last one, um, example that I'm gonna give you is the production of hormones. This is also, you think, are you sure? So this is the kidneys, are you, are you sure they produce hormones? Yes, they do. So on a much lower level than compared to other types of organs, but production of hormones. So I'm gonna give you some examples, and one is calcitriol. This is one that you've heard of before. So calcitriol is what we call the active form of vitamin D. And do you remember why we need vitamin D? I hope you got it right. So one of the big reasons why we need vitamin D is so that it can help calcium cross the border and get into the blood um, it, from the small intestine. So intestinal absorption of calcium, we're gonna need some uh, vitamin D for that. And so the, the, our kidneys can actually help produce some of that. Another hormone is called erythropoietin. So erythropoietin, you may or may not have heard of that hormone before. Erythro, what does that remind you of? That should remind you of erythrocytes. What are erythrocytes? Erythrocytes are red blood cells. That's the fancy term for red blood cells. So erythropoietin, this is a hormone that stimulates uh, the production of red blood cells. And this is, erythropoietin is created, uh, secreted, I should say, created and secreted in various organs of our body, um, and kidneys is one of them. Kidneys is one of them. So it stimulates the production of red blood cells. 
All right, so a little bit on the regions of, the, of a kidney. Um, I know that you guys have already had the, uh, the anatomy of the urinary system in lab, so I don't concentrate a whole lot on the anatomy, but I, there are some things I do want to point out. So when we're looking at, the kid, at, the, at, a, at a kidney, <clears throat> three major regions, we have the cortex, medulla, and the pelvis. Now the cortex, major functions that happen in the cortex, we have direct filtration, and that occurs with the cortical nephrons. Cortical just means it's found within, mainly found within the cortex of the um, kidney. Then we have the juxta nephrons. This word juxta, J-U-X-T-A, is a Latin term, and it's Latin for near or next to. So the juxtanephrons is, uh, that means they're, they're basically on the border of the, um, the medulla and the cortex. <clears throat> there are about 1.25 million nephrons in each kidney. So the nephron, you'll see this picture here. This is a representation of one, one nephron. And there's 1.25 million in each kidney. That's a lot. Um, the nephron is known as the functional unit of a kidney. Okay, so this is really where we're going to concentrate our efforts and we're talking about the kidney and its functions. Okay, another region is the medulla. So if we look at the medulla, medullary region, right, that's where we're looking at those pyramids um, of the kidneys. Uh, the main function of the medullary region is for reabsorption and secretion. So reabsorption and secretion. And then we have the pelvis. And the pelvis is kind of like a, a funnel. Think of the whole pelvis as being a funnel. It's a, it's, a, it's a collection area. And it's mainly responsible for excretion. It collects the urine that was created by the kidneys and it funnels it out the ureters. Okay, now we want to focus in on that nephron and particular parts of the nephron. And we're first going to start with what we call the glomerulus. So uh, the glomerulus, I know you know that, what it is because you've been uh, learning about that in lab. Um, the glomerulus is, a, is a, made up of certain structures and this is actually where the filtration is going to occur. So um, just like in our regular lecture. Um, I'm going to try to supplement with some kind of interesting videos, some animations that I think that you can learn from. So there is a video right here, a YouTube video on the glomerular filtration um, of the nephron. And so I want you to watch this particular video next. Where's my finger? Watch that video and then come back to our next slide. Okay, I hope you enjoy that video and you learn from it. We're going to talk a little bit more about this glomerular filtration as well. So glomerular filtration is a passive process. Um, it's non-selective process. So if it fits through the openings, if it fits through what we call these fenestrations, um, then it will pass through and become what we call this filtrate. Um, now those capillaries that make up part of that glomerulus or make up the glomerulus, they're highly fenestrated. This word fenestrated just means has lots of holes and, and, and ways in which these, these uh, compounds and um, molecules can get through for that filtration. But remember, this is all a passive process. So what does passive mean? That's right, it doesn't require any added energy. It doesn't require ATP for that. And so since it's a passive process, we have to think about what is the driving force of the, of the, um, of the filtration. And that's pressure. Because we're gonna have, because it's mainly water, um, it's, it's gonna be pressure or hydrostatic pressure. Now here's a term that you heard in the video uh, was net filtration pressure. Sometimes it's called net ultra filtration pressure, kind of depends on the textbook, so I put that in parentheses. But this net ultra filtration pressure is formed from the forces acting at the glomerular bed. 
Now, net, um, net refers to either gross or net. That's what that means. So you know what gross, something that is gross and then as relates to net, like your gross pay and your net pay. So if you look at your gross pay, you're gonna, it's gonna be kind of a higher number. I would say a really high number, but usually mine's not really high. <laughs> but listen, we wanted to be like your gross amount is sometimes really high, I guess, a uh, high number. And then, but then you look to see what are you gonna cash out of that check? What, what, what is the net? That's what you're actually going to get, right? The net. So you look at your gross and then you look at your net. So there's not a whole lot in your net, but what's the difference? What has come out? What's the difference between your gross pay and your net pay? Taxes, that's right, so taxes, maybe insurance comes out of that. And so what you're left with is your net pay. That's as similar as here. So our net filtration pressure, it's, it's what's, what's, what's left over, okay? Um, now, how, what, what are all the factors that go into this in order to get our net filtration pressure? And our driving force is what we call the glomerular hydro hydrostatic pressure. And it's in parentheses, I have its abbreviation. It's capital H, capital P, and a lowercase g. And that is the chief force that's pushing water and those solids out of the blood across the membrane. Um, and, it, and basically that glomerular hydrostatic pressure is coming from the blood in the glomerular cap capillaries. So this is a passive process. So we have to have a higher pressure on one side of that membrane than we do on the other side of that membrane. And the higher pressure is in the capillaries, in the blood that's in the capillaries. So that's our chief force. That is our chief force driving the water and the, um, and the solutes out of the blood across the membrane into that Bowman's capsule. Okay, that particular uh, pressure is opposed by two forces. One is called colloid osmotic pressure, or an older term for it is oncotic. And that is the presence of the non-filtered proteins in the blood uh, of the glomerulus. <clears throat> so, like I said, because of those fenestrations, because it's highly fenestrated or holy, then whatever fits through will go through. We have some larger proteins in the blood that won't fit through. And so they stay in the blood. And what happens is because of that, they create an osmotic pull back into the blood. So it's an opposing force to the glomerular hydrostatic pressure because it's pull, it's a, it creates an osmotic pull of the water and solutes back into the blood. The other opposing force is called capsular hydrostatic pressure. And capsular hydrostatic pressure is the back pressure created by the newly formed filtrate. So if we're looking at the picture that I have right above me, and we kind of visualize what's going on here, we have a lot of filtrate, we have a lot of uh, filtration occurring and as the blood circulates throughout the glomerulus, filtration is occurring, that water and solute that just came out, we call that filtrate. And so at any one given time, looking at the picture right above me, where it, where it has that yellow capsule, we're gonna find filtrate there. So it's always going to be full. It'll be full of that newly formed filtrate. It's never gonna be empty like that picture shows but it's gonna have, be full of this newly formed filtrate. And so, and then it's hard to kind of describe this, but as the blood um, goes from the, uh, circulates back out of the glomerulus, new blood is circulating in, and therefore more filtration is occurring. And the, pressure created by the newly formed filtrate already in the capsule is an opposing force because it's kind of like a bunch of people being in the hallway, just like back-to-back -back people in the hallway, and then school lets out and you're trying to get out the door to the classroom, but there's tons of people there and you can't hardly move. That's like 
what the water and solutes are experiencing. There's pressure there that they have to overcome and push through to get out. So there's a main pressure, which is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And then there's two opposing forces. So once you uh, account for those opposing forces, then we have our net ultrafiltration pressure. Okay, that is the pressure that is that is going to that we have that's moving the water and the solutes out of that blood. So I have another video for you to watch that, um, and it is right there. Uh, so go ahead and watch this video and it talks about these forces that we just talked about. So in your mind, when, when you're watching this, remember what I'm saying about the chief force and then the two opposing forces and how they relate together in order to get us our net filtration or ultra filtration pressure. And then I'll see you on the next slide. Okay. So I want to introduce you to the glomerular filtration rate. Now, what is that? That is the volume of filtrate formed each, in each minute by all the two million glomeruli in the kidneys. Um, now, this is the, glo the glomerular filtration rate is something that can be measured. Um, as it turns out, our, and sometimes we call this the GFR, the GFR is directly proportional to the net filtration pressure. We just learned about the net filtration pressure and the forces that drive it and the forces that oppose it. Now, and when we want to figure out how well is the, are, the, are the kidneys um, functioning, then it'd be really nice to be able to figure out what is the net filtration pressure. However, we have 2 million, over 2 million of these little uh, nephrons and glomeruli they're microscopic and there's no way that we can figure all of those pressures out from each of those so we have to indirectly figure this out so how we do it is by we do need to determine the net filtration pressure but what we do know is that the glomerular filtration rate is directly proportional to the net filtration pressure so the glomerular filtration rate, the GFR, we can measure that as far as urine output goes. And there's some other factors that go into that as well. Um, now here's the thing, glomerular filtration rate. The kidneys like to have a steady rate. Kidneys like to be able to do their job, do their filtration, do their other functions, and be real steady when that happens. Now, if we go back and look at what is the chief force driving the water and the solutes out of the glomerulus, what was that? Glomerular hydrostatic pressure. That's right, glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And that was the pressure of the blood inside of the capillaries there and inside the glomerulus. Well, if we look at what is the driving force of our pressure there, well, this our heart. Our heart creates our blood pressure, and then our blood vessels will help to regulate it. So our blood pressure, our overall blood pressure, will fluctuate throughout the day, whether you are laying in bed sleeping, whether you are taking a shower or um, sitting in class, whether you're driving your car. Um, you get it. So throughout the day, your blood pressure is going to fluctuate. Kidneys don't like that. Kidneys like a steady rate. They like that glomerular filtration rate to stay even. And so there's ways in which the kidneys will work to maintain that steady rate. So there's two major ways in which they do this. So one is by vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the arterioles. So they limit the amount of that blood by increasing the blood pressure and decreasing the blood pressure by vasoconstriction and vasodilation. If you vasoconstrict, is that going to increase or decrease blood pressure? Same amount of blood, but you're going to constrict that vessel around the blood. Would that increase or decrease the blood pressure? It's going to increase the blood pressure. Okay, alternately, if we 
make it bigger, make the diameter bigger if we vasodilate. Same amount of blood, is that going to increase or decrease the blood pressure? It's gonna decrease the blood pressure. And so that's one of the ways in which the kidneys can help to maintain this steady rate. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the arterioles. Um, the kidneys also do it with hormones, which we'll learn about. I have another video for you to watch. It's really hard for me to be able, I can't write on the board and I can't show you animation. So this is the best thing I got for you. So I have another video for you to watch that's going to uh, talk more about this glomerular filtration rate and how the kidneys work in order to maintain that steady rate. So this little video here, Khan Academy, love them. Um, watch that short video and then I will see you on the next slide. All right, so another way that the kidneys will help to maintain a steady uh, GFR is by hormonal regulation. So hormonal effects on the GFR are part of a larger system that involves the regulation of systemic blood pressure and includes hormone known as angiotensin II and natriuretic peptides. So this hormone pathway, the hormone pathway is named renin angiotensin aldosterone system or sometimes uh, abbreviated RAAS. Um, this is a hormone pathway. It's a very interesting hormone pathway. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of the nuts and bolts of the pathway. I will, the main thing I want you to know about this is I want you to know a, that it's, it's a hormonal pathway and what the effects are. So <clears throat> what does it attempt to do? This pathway attempts to modify or regulate the systemic blood pressure. So if you can modify the systemic blood pressure, then that can have an effect on our GFR. Now, um, so it's going to affect our systemic blood pressure, which in turn is going to affect the GFR. So GFR secondarily. So how does it do this? So as a result of the hormone pathway, what's going on? And I, and I want you to look at the bullets now. So one of the things that it does is it, it constricts the efferent ar arterioles. Sometimes they call them efferent. It's, that's a funny word for me to pronounce, efferent, but okay. Efferent or efferent, I tend to call it efferent. So vasoconstrict the efferent arterioles and the systemic blood vessels. If you are constricting the blood vessels, if you constrict the blood vessels and the same amount of blood, what did we say happens to the blood pressure? Would it increase or decrease? It's going to increase the blood pressure. Okay, you know that. All right, so that's one of the ways it happens. Okay, well, how else does it, does it do this? Um, it affects the reabsorption. So reabsorption of sodium ions chloride ions and water from the proximal tubule. We haven't gotten that far to talk about that part of the, um, the nephron yet, but it's gonna reabsorb it into the blood. It's gonna be moving sodium and chloride ions and therefore water back into the blood. If we're moving ions and water back into the blood, would we be increasing or decreasing or, increasing or decreasing our blood volume? Well, for adding to the blood, the water and the ions, we're gonna be increasing blood volume. If you increase blood volume, what does that do to blood pressure? If we increase blood volume, what does it do to blood pressure? Does it increase or decrease? It increases it, that's right. So it increases our blood pressure by increasing our blood volume. Okay, another way it does this with aldosterone release. Aldosterone is a type of hormone, um, and aldosterone will help to move those sodium and water ions back into the blood. So we're taking it out of the filtrate and moving it back into the blood, therefore increasing our volume, therefore increasing our blood pressure. Okay, another way it does that is by increasing our thirst, our drive to drink, right? 
And so we want to drink more water. If we're thirsty, we're gonna drink more water. We drink more water, we're gonna increase our blood volume, therefore increase our blood pressure, okay? So on a short term, anyway, on a short term. Okay, all of these collectively are going to increase our systemic blood pressure. And so if it's gonna increase our systemic blood pressure, what does that do to our GFR? Our glomerular filtration rate. It's gonna increase our glomerular filtration rate. So this hormone pathway works in different ways ultimately to increase our systemic blood pressure, therefore increase our glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so to get us started talking about tubular reabsorption, I have a video for you to watch. So at the very top, I want you to watch this video to introduce you to tubular reabsorption and secretion. Now, one thing to kind of remember uh, before you watch it is that once filtration occurs, you've heard me say filtrate. So the stuff that was just filtered from the blood, we now call it filtrate. It's actually not called urine until it hits the collection duct. Um, until actually really, um, it's, it's released from the collection duct, do we call it? Or do we refer to it as, as urine? We filter out a lot of our blood. We filter out a lot of our blood, of our blood plasma. And about 99% of the filtrate is actually reabsorbed back into the blood. So keep that in mind um, when you're watching that short video. When you're done with that short video, come back to this slide. Okay? All right. So on the tubular reabsorption, so hopefully you have watched that video and on the tubular reabsorption, 99% <clears throat> of the solids and the water will actually go back into the blood. So as soon as that filtrate hits the proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorption starts to occur. Pretty wild. So. One of the things, you don't want to lose the big picture of the things that are going on. You've just created a lot of filtrate, and now it gets into the nephron to the proximal convoluted tubule, and we start moving the ions and moving the substances and the water back into the blood. So what gets moved back into the blood? We're moving glucose, we're moving amino acids, sodium chloride, potassium, calcium, bicarbonate, and water. That all gets moved back into the blood. The tubular reabsorption is a reclamation process. We're reclaiming it and it's going, it's moving from inside the tubule to the blood. Okay, so this is important to remember. So it's for tubular reabsorption, the, it, we're moving it from inside the tubule back into the blood. Now, when we, when we visualize these things, it's hard, right? Especially just me, listening to me talk, it's hard. Hopefully the videos are helping um, to, for you to visualize this, but even this picture right above me that's showing the nephron, it's just pulling out one little nephron. And that's, yeah, that's what we find in the kidneys, but that's not really the setup that we find in the kidneys. We're gonna have lots of nephrons right there together and surrounding each and every part around all of those little parts of the tubules, we're gonna find blood vessels. So blood vessels are surrounding that. So we're, but that's not what we see in pictures. It's hard to visualize it because they are so microscopic. But everywhere around those tubules, we're going to find these blood vessels. And so it's gonna make it an easy process to move these ions and compounds and water from inside the tube into the blood, okay? Where specifically are they moving them into? Well, of course the blood, but which vessels? It returns them to what we call the paratubular capillaries and the vasa recta. Um, that's where, that's which uh, vessels it gets moved into. Now, how is it moving, okay? It's not moving by magic. How, how are we moving these ions, 
um, compounds in water across that border and getting it into the paratubular capillaries in Vasa recta. Um, it's moving by a combination, it depends on the substance, moves by either diffusion, by osmosis, or active transport. So these are blasts from your past. Um, diffusion, you guys know diffusion is a passive process. You already know that. Osmosis, what is osmosis? The movement of water, I knew you remembered that one. And then the active transport. Active transport requires something. What is it? It's ATP, it requires ATP, very good. I knew you would get that. It requires ATP, it requires added energy being added, being in addition to helping to move these, these uh, compounds across the border and get them back into the blood. So we're going to concentrate, we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about that on the next slide. Okay, types of transport. So we have simple diffusion, um, we have facilitated diffusion. These are ways in which we're moving compounds and ions and water across that border from inside the tubule back into the blood, into those blood vessels. <clears throat> then we have active transport. So we know that diffusion, uh, it, diffusion it, it relies on a gradient, right? You have to have higher on one side than you do on the other, then you will have movement. Now, active transport, active transport, you don't have to have a gradient for active transport. It's gonna require added energy, usually in the form of ATP, and it's going to allow you to move against the concentration gradient. Okay, so it allows us to move these compounds, these ions, across uh, the membranes and um, against the concentration gradient. Now, um, now there's two types of active transport I wanna talk about and how these molecules are moving. And um, I have a little picture for you. So I take a look over here, uniport, symport, antiport. Those describe types of transport, okay? Types of this active transport. So um, now, Symport. Symport is an older term, we sometimes call this co-transport. This happens when two substrates, two um, substrates or compounds you can think of, two co compounds or ions, are transported at the same time. They're transported at the same time in the same direction. So notice the, the and follow those arrows on that red one in the middle. They are moving two different ones in the same channel, okay, at the same time in the same direction. So we call that co-transport or symport. Another one is counter-transport or antiport. And follow, look at the arrows on the blue one. And what happens is one membrane protein is transporting two molecules, but it's doing it in opposite directions. So one molecule is going in while one molecule is going out. So that's called counter-transport or antiport. These are just ways in which we can move these compounds, these ions, across the border for, um, for reabsorption back into the blood. Now, I didn't address water. Water was one of them. Water was the one of them. And how does water move across a membrane? What do we call that? We call that osmosis, that's right. And when we're talking about water, we have to think of pressure. So we just have to have a higher water pressure on one side than we do the other, then we're gonna get water to move. You guys know all about that. Now, I wanna add to that. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down and I want you to put a star by it. Because this is gonna help you with any kind of renal physiology um, that you're gonna be asked about later on or even in a different class. So what I want you to write down is that star and put a star by it is that water follows salt. Okay, so write that down. Water follows salt. So when we're talking about the movement of water, the movement of water and water is going to follow salt. So let's think about that. If we are moving ions, if we're moving ions like sodium chloride, 
and it's going to be moved in one direction. If we're going to move sodium chloride from the inside the, the, the tubule back into the blood, what do you think is going to happen to the water? It's going to also follow the salt. It's going to be moved from inside the tubule back into the blood. Water will always follow salt. So let that be your hint. Let that, let, I want you to remember that because in, um, in fluid balance, especially in the kidneys, if you can remember that, if you can remember nothing else, <laughs> right? Nothing else that I teach you. If you can remember that water follows salt, you have a good base there. All right, you're going to have a good base as to how those ions move and how what the water does in relation to it. So if we are going to absorb more sodium chloride back into the blood, water is going to flow. Why is this important? Is because if we're going to absorb more sodium chloride ions, um, more sodium chloride into the blood, water will follow is that gonna increase or decrease our total blood volume? It's gonna increase our total blood volume. Remember what we said not too long ago about blood volume and blood pressure. If we increase blood volume, what does that do to our blood pressure? It's gonna increase our blood pressure, okay? So it really makes a big deal. It makes a big difference. Um, when we when we really follow and track these compounds and therefore the water. Okay, now we're going to apply a little bit of what we've learned so far on renal physiology. So a new uh, phrase to learn, and that is what's called transport maximum. Um, capital T, lowercase m is the abbreviation for that. An older term is called saturation. So what is the transport maximum? So a transport maximum is the total, um, this is the amount of a substance uh, that can be transported or moved by reabsorption from the tubules back into the blood. So this is the, the most amount, right? The total amount that can be moved of, a, of that substance. <clears throat> and that would be called the transport maximum. Um, so in healthy individuals, um, transport maximum is not really a problem. Um, if there is a problem, or let's say too much of a substance, not all will be will get reabsorbed. Um, and therefore, and remember what reabsorption means, it means moving from the tubule back into the blood. So if we're not moving it back into the blood, it's still left there in the filtrate and could eventually become part of the urine. And so what we say is that it will spill into the urine or be part of the urine. And so my example here is going to be for glucose. So if you look at the little picture I have on the slide, um, this is a, a little representation of, you notice the glomerulus and this is the uh, proximal convoluted tubule. And what that little conveyor belt is, it represents are the transport proteins. These are the transport proteins that line the walls of the uh, kidney tubules <clears throat> that will help to move these substances back into the blood. Okay, we're gonna use glucose as our example. So glucose in the blood. Now glucose was one of those that got filtered out. We filter out a lot of glucose, but then that was the one that got reabsorbed as well. So it's one of those compounds that get reabsorbed. Now in a healthy individual, usually um, with a normal diet, we, we, the, the, all of the glucose gets reabsorbed, okay? Now I want you to look at the A. So I'm gonna talk, you're gonna look at the picture. Um, now what's going on? And we're looking at these pink circles. Those pink circles are representing the glucose. So here you see that a lot of glucose is being, the glucose is being filtered out and by the time it hits that proximal convoluted tubule, it starts getting transported back into the blood. So you see the little um, transport protein, the little conveyor belt, and it's just working. Imagine that conveyor belt just working at a steady rate. Here comes another glucose and it's moving that glucose back into the blood. 
okay? Now let's say, let's look at B. So glucose concentration has increased in the blood. Therefore, we're gonna find more glucose being filtered out in that filtrate, right? It becomes part of the filtrate. This is the substance that starts getting reabsorbed. So what happens is here's our conveyor belt. Our conveyor belt is still moving the glucose, but now every slot on that conveyor belt is filled with glucose. It's still doing a pretty good job at moving that glucose back into the blood. And we don't just have one conveyor belt. The whole thing is lined with conveyor belts. Okay, so as the glucose comes by, it's going to take it and transport it back into the blood. Okay, now imagine this on a grand scale. So now we have all of our um, transport proteins moving as many of these glucose molecules as they possibly can back into the blood. Now, what if we have even more glucose to the blood? Therefore, even more glucose in that filtrate. If all of those transport proteins, these conveyor belts are completely full and they're working at max capacity, they're still not moving these glucose molecules back into the blood. They're moving a lot of them, but not all of them. What happens is that we start leaving some of those glucose molecules in the filtrate. Does that make sense? Okay, we've left it in the blood, in the, in the filtrate. Therefore, we can detect it in the urine. It becomes part of the urine. So what has happened is that that glucose, it, we, we've, we've exceeded the transport maximum for the glucose molecules. We've exceeded it because now it starts to show up in the urine. And this is what happens a lot of times with people who have diabetes. If they have too high of a level of glucose in the blood, therefore, they're gonna have higher level in the filtrate. And if they exceed the transport maximum, is if they exceed the transport maximum, remember what the transport maximum is, is that we're just gonna start showing up in the urine. We can detect that in the urinalysis. All right. So you think about that and um, we're going to still apply this on the next slide. Okay, you recognize our conveyor belts. And now, now I want to talk about osmotic diuretics. Now you may have heard of diuretics before and do if a diuretic is a substance that is not reabsorbed Okay, not reabsorbed in the kidneys, in the tubules, and carries out, carries out, carries water out with it. So it's not reabsorbed and it carries water out with it. Now, you learned about salt and how water follows salt. But what I can tell you is that some other particles, some other substances, um, can have an effect on that movement of water as well. And uh, we just talked about glucose. Glucose is one of them. So glucose is known as an osmotic diuretic. Now, there are different types of diuretics. This is just one type of diuretic. Do diuretics, what do diuretics make you do? If you were, to, you can take a diuretic, all right? So you can take, you can go to the drugstore, you can buy a diuretic. What do diuretics make you do? Okay, maybe you were thinking that it makes you pee more, right? You'd be right. Um, it increases urine output. Diuretics are, will increase urine output. Okay, let's think about that. And I said that there's different types of diuretics, and this is just one type called the osmotic diuretic. So glucose is a type of osmotic diuretic. So let's think about that glucose again, what you just learned about. Substance that is not reabsorbed and carries water out with it. Okay, now we talked about, now look at the picture right above me. Okay, we looked at A, we understand A. We understand B, it can only transport so many of these molecules. When we have so much in the blood, therefore so much in the filtrate, 
some of that glucose is going to be showing up in the urine. It's going to be what we call spilling out in the urine. And it's an osmotic diuretic. So what else is going to be coming out with it? Carries water out with it. So the more glucose that doesn't get transported back into the blood, the more glucose that winds up in the urine, the more water in the urine. So let's think about that. It's an osmotic diuretic. So the more of that substance that does not get reabsorbed, so therefore it's in the filtrate, therefore it makes up the urine, it's gonna take water out with it. So in diabetics who have uncontrolled blood sugar, if they have a really high blood sugar, then that means they have higher glucose in the blood. If they have higher glucose in the blood, they have higher glucose in the filtrate. If they exceed the transport maximum, which is likely, they're gonna start spilling that glucose into the blood, into the urine, and it's gonna carry water out with it. So you're gonna have increased urine output because of that. So they tend to have increased urine output in those circumstances because of that. It's taking the water out with it. So that's one example of an osmotic diuretic. Um, caffeine is another type of diuretic. Caffeine can do that. Um, alcohol is a type of diuretic. And, but alcohol work, is a different type of uh, diuretic. It works, um, it, it inhibits a hormone, actually. A alcohol will inhibit a hormone called anti-diuretic hormone. Okay, so if it inhibits anti-diuretic hormone, it becomes the diuretic. And so it's just a different mechanism, but it will increase the urine output. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is renal threshold. This all plays a role together called renal threshold. Now, what is the renal threshold? It's the plasma concentration at which specific compound or ion will begin to appear in the urine. Okay, looking back at our A, B, and C right above us, okay, it's at C when we start to see the, the glucose start to appear or spill into the urine. It gets detectable in the urine. Okay, let's read this again, renal threshold. The plasma concentration, so now that we're talking about the blood, the plasma concentration at which a specific compound or ion will begin to appear in the urine. So we can, we, we, can now figure how much glucose has to be in the blood in order to exceed the transport maximum in the kidneys and start to show up in the urine, be detectable in the urine. So how, what is that renal threshold? And that renal threshold is a plasma concentration. So that is something that we can check in the blood. So we can do a blood check for glucose and if it reaches a certain level, the renal threshold, we know that it's going to exceed the, the transport maximum and start to show up in the urine, be detected in the urine. So we know those numbers, those plasma concentrations for all different types of compounds, for almost everything in our body. When um, pharmaceutical companies are making new medicines, this is one of the things that they have to um, they have to determine is the uh, renal threshold. How much of this medicine, how, how high is this medicine have to be in order to exceed the transport maximum and start to be detectable in the urine? And so the next time that you get a medicine, um, sometimes when you get medicine, uh, it, you get it still in the box and you have that little leaflet that comes with it open up that leaflet, usually it's pretty big, and I think it's like in like five font or something. You can hardly read it, but if you get a magnifying glass and read it, I want you to look for it because I want you to look for renal threshold because it's always on there, and it'll tell you what is that renal threshold. So that means that renal threshold, when it's at that level in your blood, it's going to exceed the transport maximum and start to spill into the urine. It will be detectable in the urine. Okay, now on to tubular secretion. So I hope you did learn, you got at least got to visualize tubular secretion from the videos that you watched. And um, tubular secretion really happens, um, it starts at the proximal convoluted um, 
tubule and continues to the distal convoluted tubule. And, and throughout that, um, that, that nephron, your blood is cleaned out again. So that's an easy way to remember it. Your blood is, is cleaned out again. Tubular secretion is the movement of these substances from the blood into the kidney tubule. So they flow from the paratubular capillaries into the tubules. Now, what gets secreted um, into the tubules? So lots of different types of ions. So potassium ions, hydrogen ions, metabolites of drugs, and by that I mean medicines, um, and nitrogenous wastes. And we talked about nitrogenous wastes a little bit earlier in the lecture. So those nitrogenous wastes, they're gonna get secreted um, from the paratubular capillaries into the tubules. Now, um, we don't, we still refer to the substance that's in the tubules as filtrate. We don't call it urine until it leaves the collection duct. Um, but urine production requires, um, it, it requires us to maintain homeostasis by regulating the volume of blood and the blood plasma com um, composition. So even though we're filter, we initially filter out a lot of our blood plasma, um, in the, the solids there within, we start that reclamation process, the reabsorption, but then we can also secrete. We secrete these substances from the paratubular capillaries into the tubules. So it's a way for us to regulate, really regulate that urine. So if we had to pick one of those three major processes between filtration, absorption, and secretion, of which one really helps to maintain to regulate the concentration of that urine, we're really going to have to pick the tubular secretion on that one. Um, because this is really where, where that, where that a concentrate, where it really gets concentrated in, in tubular secretion. Okay, as you can see from this graphic that I put up, um, there is a lot of movement of water and solutes that occurs through that kidney tubule. Um, about 99% of that original filtrate will be reclaimed back into the blood. And so it, and really it depends on like which part of that kidney tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the, the, the loop, um, older term for that is the loop of Henle, <clears throat> and then the distal convoluted tubule, um, uh, slightly different types of molecules will cross the border in those areas. Uh, so you can see from the picture. Now, I'm not going to ask you to know which gets where, um, but I will ask you to know what gets moved by absorption, what gets secreted, and I want to um, also know about that water movement as well. So this gives you a little bit of overview on those ions, which way that they are moving and whether it's um, absorption, reabsorption or secretion. I do want you to know the difference between those two as well. So if I asked you to describe tubular reabsorption, could you do it? If I asked you to describe secretion, could you do it? Okay, what gets secreted? Which way is it moving? Right, is in secret, let me ask you a question. Um, in secretion, is the secretion described as the movement of solutes and other molecules from inside the renal tubule back into the blood? No, it is not. It is the movement of these solutes, movement of these substances from the blood, from the paratubular capillaries into the renal tubules. Okay, so please know the direction and the movement of those molecules. Okay, so the kidneys effectively conserve water by producing a very concentrated urine. Um, and it's very concentrated, it's up to about 1200 milliosmoles. I won't ask you about that. Um, but it's basically by two major mechanisms. 
And one is the release of antidiuretic hormone that turns off facultative water reabsorption. We talked a little bit about ADH, um, but not much. What I really want to concentrate on is the um, another process by which this happens, which is the medullary osmotic gradient. So the osmotic gradient, gradient created in the medulla, in those pyramids of the kidneys. Um, this is an osmotic gradient um, that allows for reabsorption of water out of the filtrate. So looking at the picture, I really want you to uh, look at this picture and um, look at uh, number one first and, and kind of listen to me talk about what's going on there. So this is called the countercurrent mechanism. This countercurrent mechanism creates and maintains the med medullary um, osmotic gradient by exchanging materials in opposite directions between the filtrates and the interstitial fluids. It involves the following factors, what's called a countercurrent multiplier system in the nephron and um, the recycling of urea in the medullary collecting ducts, medullary, medullary collecting ducts. I always have a problem pronouncing that. A countercurrent exchanger, exchanger in the vasa recta. Remember the vasa recta was one of those blood vessels that surrounds the tubes. So looking at number one, um, you see, we recognize um, um, sodium chloride. So sodium chloride and what's going on with the sodium chloride. So, so it's actively being transported from the filtrate um, into the interstitial fluid. So some of that salt is going into the interstitial fluid. Now, remember what I said about when salt moves, what follows? So water always follows salt. So when salt moves, water follows. Sodium chloride is going into the interstitial fluid. And so where do you think the water goes? That's right, look at number two. So the sodium chloride pumped into the interstitial fluid, which is gonna draw the water out of the filtrate and into that interstitial fluid. Okay, so wherever the salt goes, the water follows. So now we're creating this osmotic gradient. Okay, so keep that in mind and we're moving on to the next slide. Okay, continuing. Now we're looking at, what I want you to look at is number three on the, on the picture. And just listen to me talk about that. So as sodium chloride continues to be removed from the filtrate, water continues to follow by making the filtrate more concentrated. That makes sense. If we're removing the salt, therefore water follows, the urine is becoming more concentrated. The high sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate allows for continued sodium chloride reabsorption into the inter interstitial fluid. So we're moving on to number four, the permeability of the med medullary collecting system to urea is another important factor in the establishment of the medullary osmotic gradient. The medullary osmotic gradient created by the countercurrent multiplier and urea recycling is maintained by the vasa recta, that blood vessel that surrounds it, acting as a countercurrent exchanger. So not only are we considering the movement of the water and the solutes from inside the tubule um, into the back into the blood and from the blood into the tubule, right, with reabsorption and secretion, but we also see movement of these solutes and water into the interstitial fluid that surrounds the renal tubules. This is a big deal, okay? So th this, this movement in and out of that interstitial fluid allows for movement of reabsorption and secretion. So they both play a role. They both play a role together in maintaining that urine and concentrating the urine, right? Because the urine is much more concentrated than the blood. Okay, so we know that the, by the time the filtrate 
um, empties out of the collection duct, then we call that urine. So now on to the pelvis of the kidney. Remember I said it's like a big funnel. So it's gonna funnel that urine down the ureter to the bladder. Now the urinary bladder is a hollow distensible organ. Uh, it's found in the pelvic cavity floor and held in place by the par parietal peritoneum. Um, these are things that you've probably learned in lab. The bladder collapses, so it, it collapses when empty, but becomes pear-shaped when full, holding about seven to 800 milliliters of urine in males and slightly less in females. Now, micturition, so that particular word, micturition, it's also known as urination or voiding, is the discharge of urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. Um, there is what's called a micturition reflex, and it's a reflex arc mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. When urine fills the bladder and stretches the walls, um, this, this picture, right, this picture right here summarizes the, um, the reflex. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. The stretch receptors in the walls of the urinary bladder um, send a signal to the sacral region of the spinal cord uh, via sensory afferent fibers. And you can see that um, on the picture. Okay, so we're on to, I guess, number two. Okay, and we're following the blue line. So it's sending this, um, this signal via the afferent fibers. Then sympathetic efferent fibers stimulate the detrusor muscle to contract and the internal urethral sphincter to relax, which allows for micturition or urination. That's when it comes out. The micturition center is found in the pons of the central nervous system. Um, that given time and training makes micturition a voluntary process. So where's your pons? Do we remember where the pons is? Yep, right there on that brainstem. So, even though this is our a, a, a parasympathetic reflex arc, we still have the control over this because it's going to that brain center. Kind of neat. So that's called micturition. All right, this ends our lecture on the urinary system. I hope you've learned a lot. And if you have any questions, write them down now, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have.